I hope to stir things up with a few uh, suggestions today about what could, could happen uh, to the world in the future. And my aim is to go beyond the ordinary green ideas uh, and try and make the argument that economic and ecological sustainability go together, that we don't have to choose between being green and being uh, more prosperous. We can actually do both at the same time. London's air is much cleaner than when uh, Monet painted this picture in 1904. Uh, and that's despite the fact that London's a much bigger city with, much, with people using far more resources and far more energy. I want you to look at the green line. You can't read the details, but what the green line says is that the world GDP increases roughly tenfold in the current century, so that the average person has ten times as many goods and services available to them in 2100 as they do today. Uh, that's hugely richer than today. It's the most prosperous of the scenarios in these models. And here's a description of the world that that uh, model actually would, uh, the, the assumptions that have gone into that model. Uh, it's a world in which energy and mineral resources are abundant because of rapid technical progress, which both reduces the need, the resources needed to produce a given level of output and increases the economically recoverable reserves, and that this rapid technological progress frees natural resources currently devoted to the provision of human needs for other purposes, which increases ecologic resilience. So these guys are saying that if we get richer, we can actually have a more ecologically resilient planet. Now, where does this come from? Some nutty right-wing think tank? No, this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is taken directly from their website. This is one of their scenarios. And in fact, the green one, as the numbers above the graph show, is the one with the least warming. Because they're assuming that if we get this rich, we will invent subcritical nuclear reactors and fusion and things like that, so we'll stop using uh, carbon-rich fuels. So in other words, even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, is coming to the conclusion that the richer we get, the cleaner the planet can get. In my lifetime, the world population has doubled to 7 billion people. But people have more food. On every continent, the calories available per capita per day have gone up. And yet at the same time, during that period, we have returned land to forest on a pretty massive scale, mostly in the rich West. What makes this possible? The fact that we've increased agricultural yields is the main one. The fact that we've trebled the amount of calories we get from rice, wheat, and maize over this period, the three big <laughs> crops that provide us with 60% of our calories. We've trebled it over 60 years, and yet we've not increased the acreage devoted to growing these crops at all. That's remarkable. That's what saved the rainforest from going extinct, the fact that we've been able to increase the productivity of the farmland we've got. If we were trying to feed 7 billion people from... Uh, with the, the technologies of 50 years ago, we would need twice as many uh, acres under the plough as we have. The environmental movement has told us throughout this period that this couldn't be done. Here's an example. Lester Brown in 1974. Farmers could no longer keep up with rising demand for food, and famine is inevitable. He said something similar last week. And we could do that again, because... All we've got to do, really, is get fertilizer to Africa and irrigation and tractors and all these other technologies, and you would see an enormous leap in the productivity of the world. I mean, the yields in sub-Saharan Africa are still bumping along where they were 40 or 50 years ago. If we close that gap, then we'll find that uh, we'll pretty well treble <coughs> agricultural production, as even if we don't use new technologies, genetic modification, nitrogen use efficiency, and all these other things. And more and more of us are living in cities. <coughs> the rural population of the world is probably now actually shrinking, whereas the urban population continues to go up. Now, that's good news for the environment, because on all sorts of measures, it becomes clear that the urban city dwellers have a smaller footprint. They use less resources per head. They use less land. Uh, uh, they're, more, they're more efficient because they're closer together and so on. Uh, and indeed, there's another factor about cities too, which is that they are engines of innovation. Jeffrey West, a scientist at the Santa Fe Institute, has shown that the more a city grows, the disproportionately more inventive it becomes. You're bound to see a rate of innovation that goes up. And we are shrinking the human footprint. Back when we were hunter-gatherers, we needed 1,000 hectares per head. That's the average area that hunter-gatherers need today uh, to support their lifestyle. And as far as we can make out, it's what we would have needed uh, a long time ago. Um, by the time we were slash-and-burn farmers, we needed 10 hectares. If we were to go back to, to, to living with nature, 
If 7 billion people were to go back to nature and try and live off the land, it would be a catastrophe for nature. And the amount of the sunlight that falls on vegetation and creates greenery that we pinch for ourselves and our domestic animals is still only about 24% of, of uh, what's available on the planet. This is a calculation by Helmut Harbel of the University of Klagenfurt. Uh, about 14% is consumed by us and our crops, and about another 10% is destroyed by either overgrazing or concreting or whatever. Um, so we're still leaving uh, three quarters of the, of, the, uh, of the net primary production to the natural world. And in fact, we're actually increasing that in many ways, because what we do is we, uh, our, uh, the fertility of our agricultural crops also leaks into our natural environments and makes them more productive, things like irrigation and fertilizer. And meanwhile, if you look around the world and you see where ecological devastation is happening, it's not happening in the countries that are rich and, and uh, technologically advanced. It's happening in places like Haiti. This is a satellite and an aerial photograph of the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Haiti on the left, Dominican Republic on the right. One is brown, the other is green. Why? Because Haiti relies for all its energy on uh, renewable energy, particularly wood. And as a result, it is 98% deforested. It uses charcoal not only for cooking, but in industry as well. The Dominican Republic subsidizes propane as a cooking fuel, specifically so that people won't go into the forest and cut down trees. So the best way of, of protect, protecting biodiversity is often to get poor people in the world to stop using the local environment, to stop competing with natural ecosystems for energy by giving them an energy source that natural systems don't need. And the same is true in our cities. We are, you know, cities like London now have uh, foxes all over them. Um, why is that? Uh, I mean, there's so much wildlife in the middle of the city. I gather there are even glistening wet otters in Horse Guards Parade. Um, that's a reference to Boris's uh, remark the other day. Um, but why are we allowed, how come it's possible for foxes to live in cities? Well, when you think about it, it would, 500 years ago, they would never have been allowed to, to live for seconds because someone would have wanted their fur for a coat, uh, whereas now we don't need that because we have synthetic fleeces that come out of oil wells instead. And it's the same, the, the number of whales in the world is increasing, whale stocks are going up, so are seals, so are penguins. Why? Because we don't need their blubber as a fuel and as a lubricant anymore or to make soap. We get it instead from petroleum. We get it from rocks underground. And those rocks underground with uh, 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 fossil fuels in them are not running out. Uh, in, in practice, we have got a long way to go. We've used less than a thousandth of the total energy uh, in uh, uh, fossil fuels in the crust of the Earth. Now, a lot of what remains is not going to be easy to get at and may never be practical as a, as a source of energy. The blue stuff, the methane clathrates on the ocean floor, for example, are um, uh, uh, almost certainly a very long way off being turned into a fuel source, although the Japanese are on the case, so don't bet against it. But we do keep turning some of these sources into available sources of energy. So for example, shale gas was simply inaccessible for a very long time. Now, suddenly, it's a big chunk of energy that we've got available, and it's now very cheaply available. And shale gas has had a dramatic impact uh, in the United States, where it's being exploited first. It has caused a collapse in demand for coal as gas gets much cheaper. Gas is now roughly a third of the price in America that it is in, in Europe. Uh, and as a consequence, it is rapidly replacing coal in electricity generation. It's beginning to replace oil in transport. You're seeing more and more natural gas vehicles in trucks and buses and so on. Uh, and it's had this extraordinary, it's also boosting manufacturing and the chemical industry because of the cheapness of the feedstock. Um, and it's had this unexpected environmental benefit, which is that it has dramatically cut US carbon emissions. The USA, without regulation, without a cap and trade policy, has cut carbon emissions back to the early 1990s levels, whereas Europe, with all these policies, has not yet cut them at all. Well, what about climate change? Isn't all this a problem, though, if we continue to use fossil fuels? Are we not going to uh, mess up the climate and see dramatic changes uh, in, in the climate? Here's what's happened to the average of the Earth's temperature according to five different uh, measurement sets, uh, two, two satellite, three surface, uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, and as you can see, the, the temperature has gone up. And I'm someone who thinks that we are seeing climate change, we are seeing man-made warming, we are seeing it because of carbon dioxide. I believe fully in all the aspects of the greenhouse, well, the, the, green, the specific greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide is something I completely accept. 
Uh, and what we're seeing is consistent with it. We've seen about 0.4 of a degree of warming over the last 30 years. It is happening slower than was predicted. Two measures, the blue and the green, by one satellite, one surface, averaged out. It's the same graph as on the other one, just uh, smoothed. Uh, and they, sh they are both now below the low prediction made in 1990 by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, even though carbon dioxide emissions are higher than assumed in the high line. So actually, there is no question that the temperature is changing slower than was predicted. However, so I think there's something wrong with the models that are being used by these organizations. Sea level is rising. It's rising at the rate of about 3.86, uh, sorry, 2.86 millimeters a year. That's about a foot per century. We had about a foot of set, uh, sea level rise in the 20th century. We're on track to have about the same in the 21st. Um, that's not a problem, a foot per century, it, only if it accelerates, but it's showing no sign of acceleration. If anything, it's decelerating. In fact, sea level fell in, in, in a year, a couple of uh, years ago. So um, uh, Greenland is losing ice at the rate of about 200 gigatons a year. That's a lot of ice, but it's 0.7% per century. At this rate, Greenland will take 10,000 years to lose all its ice. That's the number they keep leaving out. So what's wrong with the models? Well, I think what's wrong is that the carbon dioxide effect of warming is exactly on track. We're seeing exactly what we should, which is about 1 to 1.2 degrees of warming for a doubling of carbon dioxide, roughly a third of which we've had already. That's what the models say. That's what the, 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 the physics says. If you don't think the IPCC agrees with that, go and check paragraph 8.6.2.3 of their last report. Uh, that's how much warming you get from a doubling of carbon dioxide. But they also say that there's an amplification by water vapor, that because of this warming, you'll get more, water, more evaporation, the humidity in the atmosphere will act as a further greenhouse gas and will treble the warming to something like three degrees. And that's the bit where I part company and where an awful lot of people part company. There is no consensus on that. In fact, the evidence for the absence of the tropical uh, troposphere hotspot, the humidity in the atmosphere, et cetera, is such that this, the evidence is actually against this trebling existing at all. In fact, the evidence is more consistent with there being a slight dampening from white water vapor because water vapor has a habit of forming clouds which reflect light back into space. Somewhere between those two, there's going to be the truth. And I don't know where yet, but all I can say is that at the moment, the evidence we're seeing is consistent with a mild warming which will pr produce net benefits rather than net disadvantages. Now, the measures we are taking, some of them are great, but others are actually going to do more harm than good. I'll give you the example of wind power. Wind power at the moment produces about 0.5% of the total energy in this country, uh, and about uh, the same globally. Um, and it hasn't even displaced that much carbon emissions because you need backup power for it. So it's making a trivial difference to carbon emissions. And it's never going to get there because it's such a low density form of energy. Even if we covered the whole of Australia with, with wind farms, we'd, we wouldn't make much of a difference. You'd have to build 96 square kilometers of wind farm every day just to keep up with the increase in global energy demand at the moment, let alone uh, to make a dent in the actual use. And as for biofuels, the situation's even worse. We turned 5% of the grain crop into uh, motor fuel last year, displacing just 0.6% of the world's uh, oil use. So it made a trivial difference to carbon emissions. But it drove up the price of food. And, um, we are killing 190,000 people a year with this policy. That's the latest estimate. In other words, by pushing up the price of food, tipping people into malnutrition, and killing some of them as a consequence of malnutrition, that's what we're doing. And we're also putting pressure on the rainforest uh, with this policy. And at the same time, we're rejecting some technologies and some policies that could do real good. Genetic modification of crops has now been shown in other continents than this one to increase yields substantially and to cut pesticide use. Isn't that what we want to do? So, my argument is that we can have more for less, that actually we can have a sustainable future. But at the moment, some of our policies are actually asking today's poor to pay for tomorrow's rich. Mm -hmm.